Well, welcome today to part two of our series called Great Relationships, where we're taking what Jesus, the greatest relationship expert ever, has to say about relationships, and then we're applying it so that we have better marriages, better dating relationships, better relationships with our boss or our coworkers, our family, and our friends. Now, I got to be perfectly, perfectly honest with you as we get started with today's message. What I'm about to share with you, I'm preaching it to myself just as much as I am you. I am no means an expert on what we're going to talk about, and that is be a little less critical and a little more kind in your speech. Anybody with me? You need to be a little less critical and a little bit more kind. Maybe those of you online, you can type in the chat. Yeah, that, that's me as well. How many of you uh, say, not only is it for me, but I know some people that need to hear this, that they need to be a little less critical, a little more kind. All right, how many of you are sitting next to the person that do not raise your hand? Do not raise your hand. They'll just criticize you for raising your hand. So don't, don't do that, all right? <laughs> All right, let's, let's jump right into it today. If you got a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we're going to hang out today. I do want to welcome those of you that are watching online with us. Right now, you notice in the upper right-hand corner of your screen there, there's a button called Talk Notes. If you'll just push that, that's going to take you to all the scriptures I'm going to look at today, as well as all the points I'm going to be making. For those of you that are live here in the room, welcome to you as well. If you go to your smartphone or your tablet, and you go to our website, exponential.church, you're able to access all the Talk Notes there as well. So Matthew chapter 7, let me give you a little bit of context of what we're going to be looking at here. Jesus is in the midst of his famous Sermon on the Mount, and he is about to give what is one of the most quoted Bible verses that we have. This is one you probably know. In fact, people that don't even come to church, people that don't even believe in Jesus, they know this verse. So let's look at it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, the very beginning of the verse, Jesus says, do not judge, period. Do not judge, period. How many of you have ever said that before? You, you know that verse. That's one that you got memorized, right? Do not judge, period. How many of you have heard other people say that? Do not judge. Even people that aren't followers of Jesus. Have you ever heard Somebody that isn't even a follower of Jesus, they know this first. They're like, well, wait a second. Doesn't the Bible tell you not to judge people? You shouldn't be judging. Do not judge, period. I mean, it's fun to say. <laughs> In fact, everybody, hold up your finger like this. Everybody put a finger up like this. Those of you online, you know, I don't care. Well, maybe if you're like driving. Well, you shouldn't be watching the video if you're driving anyway. But anyway, follow along. Put a, put a finger up like this, ready? And you can actually do it. You can shake a finger. You can go, do not judge period. It's fun. Let, let's try it one more time. Ready? Because it's just so much fun. Ready? Do not judge, period. Now, here's the problem. Jesus didn't say do not judge, period. Jesus said, look at it, do not judge, comma. He didn't say do not judge, period. He said do not judge, comma, and others. He wants to have a conversation with us about what it does mean to, to judge and, and what that would look like. And this is a conversation that we need to have, especially when it comes to this whole area of criticism. Because, you, you know, so often the world tells you you've got two options when you see somebody doing something wrong. One is just shut up and don't say anything about it. Just sweep it under the rug, just ignore it. That, that's one option they give you. The other option, and this is in our society and culture right now, the more common one, is in the meanest, harshest, most vile way that you can, get on social media, especially on Twitter, and tell everybody how wrong they are and try to get them canceled. That just doesn't seem right, does it? That those are our only two options? Either just ignore that people are doing wrong or to like just put them down and, and condemn them in the meanest, harshest, most vile way ever. I mean, is that what Jesus was talking about here when he says, do not judge? Well, obviously not. So let's explore exactly what was he talking about. So first thing you need to know is that the word judge in Greek is the word krino, and it's used 115 times in the New Testament. Now, like a lot of words, it, it, its definition is dependent on the context in which it's used in. So, krino, sometimes it's used in the context of, 
evaluation or, or analyzing something. On the other end of the spectrum, it's to condemn and to, to judge in the way that we would think, right? That, that you're being mean about it. You're being harsh. You're being very, very critical. And so when Jesus says, do not judge, is he saying never to analyze and evaluate things? Many of you, you know, I have a, a ministry to professional poker players. And in addition to doing that, I'm a very good player myself. And, you know, with, with me, I don't get to play full-time. I have very close friends. that It's their full-time profession. That's all they do. And so from time to time, you know, some of the guys will say to me, hey, go over to saw hey, play that hand there. That, you know, there's a better way that, that you could have gone about doing that one. Do I go at that point, do not judge me. No, that'd be silly, right? Because what they're doing is they're, they're analyzing, they're, they're evaluating, and, and I invite that criticism in because I want to be better. Now, that's a silly thing like playing a card game. Don't we all want to be better in life? And so there is this area that we should invite people to analyze and, and to evaluate our lives, and we, again, we should be welcoming that. So when Jesus says, do not judge here, he's actually on that opposite end of the spectrum. He's like, don't be mean, don't be harsh, don't criticize with, with a, a mean spirit. And by the way, we, we know that Jesus was using that end of the spectrum, not the other end. And that he just wasn't saying, don't ever like judge people. Because in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives a very, very detailed explanation of how to go about judging somebody that's hurt you. How to confront them in a, a way that is going to help them and it's going to help your relationship. So Jesus talks about that. And then in John chapter 7, verse 24, it's even clearer. Jesus says this, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead do what? Judge correctly. In other words, he's saying there's a wrong way to judge and then there's a right way to judge other people. So we're not to speak harshly. We're not to condemn people. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had somebody that judged you that way? That they were harsh with you? That they were condemning you? That they were putting you down? They were mean about it? Have you ever had that before? Somebody spoke to you like that? even if they were speaking the truth, you later realize, you know what, they are actually right. It still wasn't helpful to you because of how they said it. And so here's the deal. If you didn't find it helpful to be spoken to that way, what makes you think it's going to be helpful if you speak to people in that way? And so what Jesus is talking about here is we have got to be very, very careful. It's not that we never, ever judge. Sometimes we need to to analyze, to evaluate, to correct, to help people. But we've got to do it with the right motivation and we've got to take the right approach as we're doing it. All right, so let's look at Jesus' words here because all I've given you so far is do not judge, period, or do not judge, comma. You know, what, what was he doing? Let's look at the full context here. Look at Matthew 7, 1 to 2. Jesus says this, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Well, if you think about it, those are a couple scary verses right there. You hear what Jesus is saying? Be careful. When you judge other people, realize that the measure you use to judge them is the measure that I myself will judge you in the future. Let me give you another perspective, another way to think about this. How many of you ever had a time that maybe you said something or you did something, you didn't mean it, and it was, you know, you were just having a bad day, right? And something slipped out or you, you did something, and you actually said to the other person, you're like, could, could you cut me a break? It's been a, it's been a rough day. It's, it's been a rough week. You, you ever done something like that before? 
You ask for other people to, to cut you a break on something. In other words, you want people to, to take into account the fullness and, and the wholeness of the context of you. You want them to take into account the kind of day that you've had, the kind of week that you've had. You want them to take into account, you know, your personality and your background. You want them to, to take into account maybe some things that have happened throughout the day. You know, you, your kid threw up this morning and it just, you know, it's been a snowball all day long. You want them to take into account that your boss was a jerk all day long. You want them to take into account everything that makes you, you. And you're like, hey, cut me a little slack here. Give me a break. Look at the, the fullness of everything. And so we expect that for ourselves. And so again, if that's what we want for ourselves, isn't that what we should be doing for others? That as we speak to them, we see something going on, and we're like, well, that's not right. Shouldn't we take into account the, the fullness of the context of their situation, of everything that's happening? I mean, why is it that we don't offer the same kind of grace and kindness and mercy to others that we would want for ourselves? Well, the answer is actually quite simple, and it's quite convicting as well. Put it on your outline this way. I often judge others by their actions and myself on my intentions. Say that again. I often judge others by their actions and myself on my intentions. We do something, we go, oh, no, I... I knew better than that. I didn't really mean to do that or to say that or use that tone. That was not my intention at all. But yet when other people do it, oh, we go ballistic. How dare they talk to me like that? How dare they do that? How dare they use that kind of tone with me? Can you see how damaging that is to relationships? When we base others off of their actions, but ourselves, off of our intentions. Again, I, I'm far from perfect in this area, and so I hope you'll join me in, in trying to work on it to, to get better, that when we see something that, oh man, we, we take everything into account. Jesus is then going to go on and explain this a little bit more. So he just said, look, do not judge, or you too will be judged in the same way that you judge others. It's going to, or the same way the measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. He's going to give a little bit more detail here. He's going to use a little bit of an illustration, and he's going to use quite a bit of hyperbole here as well. Look at verses three to four. He says, You can see the speck in your friend's eye, but you don't notice the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye or out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. Now, I, I've heard pastors preach on this one before, and they'll usually say something like this. They'll go, well, you know, what Jesus is saying here is before you like talk to somebody about the wrong that you see in their life, evaluate your own life and, and make sure that there's no sins that are in your life that are bigger than their sins. Because if you have a bigger sin than what they have, then just don't even say anything. You know, take, take that plank out of your own eye. Don't, don't be a hypocrite like that. But as long as your sin is smaller than what their sin is, then go ahead and point it out. But that's not what Jesus is saying here at all. Because I, I want you to notice here that, that Jesus didn't say, uh, you know, anything like, if there's a plank in your eye. He didn't say if. He didn't say if there's a bigger plank in your eye. Now, what did Jesus say? He goes on to say, when all the time there's a plank in your eye. What Jesus is saying is every time you notice something in somebody else's eye, something they're doing wrong, always remember that there's a plank in your own eye. In other words, that your sin in your own life is always to be viewed as bigger than somebody else's. That you shouldn't be saying, well, there's big sins and, and little sins. You got to realize that I am a sinner. I have got a plank in my eye 
all the time. The Apostle Paul reminded of this in Romans 3.23 when he writes, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, we fall short of the glory of God. Does all include you? Does all include me? Does all include everybody before, after, and during? You know, everybody. We've all sinned. We all have this plank in our own eye. And our tendency is we like to compare our sin to other people's. And we go, oh, well, they killed somebody. Oh, they stole. Oh, they had an affair. Their sin is bad as compared to mine. And so that, therefore, gives me the right to go and judge them. We have all sinned, fall short of the glory of God. We all have that plank in our own eye. Jesus says, quit thinking about big sins and little sins. Constantly in your mind, you should be going, my sin is bigger than anybody else's. Oh my goodness, I've got a plank in my own eye. Listen, nobody knows your life and your sin more so than you and Jesus. You know the things that you've done. You know the things that you've done publicly. You know the things that you've done privately. You know the bad motives that you sometimes have had. Even bad motives in doing things in the name of Jesus. You haven't always done things in pure motives and with a pure heart. You know the, the wickedness and the depravity of your own heart. There's a plank in your eye. But here's what else you know as a follower of Jesus. He forgave you of that. If you've begun a relationship, if that's God, could you tell him I'm busy right now? Thanks. All right. All right. You know how certain ringtones, like, you don't associate with certain people. I would have never have associated, Andrew, that, uh, that ringtone with you. <laughs> hey, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <laughs> you know, I'm just picking on you, right? That's okay. He says, all right. Yeah, I got the, let me turn my buzzer on just in case, right? I got a plank in my own eye, right? But that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get you to see is, look, Wow, what was that now? That was a bird. <laughs> See, those of you online, you're missing the live experience because I know you can't hear any of that. Man, it's like a tropical rainforest in here right now. <laughs> Are we good? Can I proceed? Yeah. <laughs> I got all day. Actually, I don't. We're heading on vacation right as soon as I'm done. As soon as I say amen, we're on vacation. So, all right, let, let's get moving here, people. Let's get. <laughs> Jesus has forgiven us of our sin. That's good news. That big old plank in my eye, that big old plank in your eye, it, it's been taken care of. And so, if He's forgiven us in that way, what he's saying is, look, use that knowledge then as a springboard in how you interact with other people. Use that knowledge of the forgiveness that you've received in, in, in order to not become self-righteous and, and not becoming a person that's always pointing the finger of those bad people out there and you're judging in the way that he said not to judge. And I would say this, do this not only for your sake, and for the sake of the people you're speaking to, but do this for the sake of the kingdom of God. Because there are people that are not yet Christians that they say the number one reason I don't become a Christian is because Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. They're always pointing the finger at everybody else's sin. They're shining a spotlight on other people's sin, but yet making light of their own sin. And so if you don't do it for anybody else, just do it so people can come into a relationship with Him. All right, so then with all that said, how do we go about addressing the sin that we see in somebody else's life? How do we judge but do it in the correct way? Well, again, the answer is not to ignore it. 
I think that's what a lot of people do. They're like, well, we're all sinners anyway, so God, he'll, he'll figure it out for them. I don't need to say anything. But we can't ignore it. No, we've got to first be reminded that there's a plank in my own eye. And then look at what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 5 as he continues on. He says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. That's what we were just talking about. He says, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Look at that again. Read that again slowly. Jesus is saying that, yes, it is our job to reach out and remove that speck, that sin from our brother, from our sister's eye. That is our job. But remember, he says, first of all, you got to remove the plank from your own eye because only then will you be able to see clearly to remove that speck from your brother's eye. Now, you're going, Gilbert, I, I don't know that I can remove the plank from my own eye. Guess what? You're absolutely right. You can. And this is where Jesus, the, the master storyteller, the master teacher, I think he is using a lot of these uh, illustrations and things very, very intentionally here. Because he says, remove the plank, remove the beam from your own eye. You can't do that. But it was the beam that he hung on, that he was crucified on, that plank that he got nailed to, that is how your sin can be forgiven. That's how the plank gets removed from your own eye because of the plank that he went to. Does that make sense? Isn't that good news? You can't do anything about your wickedness. You can't do anything about your own depravity. Only Jesus and his shed blood on the cross can do that for you. And so Jesus says, look, when you go into a conversation with someone else, first of all, remember your own sin. Remember the amount of grace that you've been given. And then you'll have the clearness to be able to talk to that person that's gotten involved in a, a sexual sin or drugs or alcohol or they're treating people in the wrong way. Maybe they're making poor financial decisions. In other words, now that your heart is in the right posture, now you're going to be able to help other people remove that speck from their own eye. And again, I believe Jesus is very, very intentional here in his storytelling and the illustrations that he's using. And then he used an eye as the illustration. Why didn't Jesus say, you know, uh, remove the splinter from your own finger or, or remove the obstruction from your own throat? Why did he use the eye? I think it's because Jesus realized just how sensitive the eye is. Did you know that the eye basically is the most sensitive part of your body, has the, the potential for the most pain in your entire body? That your cornea is 600 times more sensitive than any other part of your skin? How many of you ever had something caught in your eye before? It hurts like nobody's business, doesn't it? And you're like, I'll do anything to get that out of there. How many of you have ever been around somebody when they had something stuck in their eye and they can't get it out and they've asked you, hey, could, could you look at my eye? Could you, could you try to help get this out? And when you do that, just instinctively, instinctively, you know just how sensitive the eyeball is. And so when you go to try to help get that little speck out, that hair, that piece of sawdust, whatever it is, you are extra cautious, aren't you? You are extra gentle with them because you know just how sensitive it is. And this is what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. That yes, your job as a follower is to help point out the sin in other people's lives. Now, first of all, remember your own sin. Remember there is a plank in your own eye. Remember the grace and the mercy that you've been given. But as you go then to quote unquote judge somebody else, you have got to be extra cautious. You've got to be extra gentle with them. Be careful. Show them grace. Show them mercy. Show them love. Show them forgiveness if it's needed. We've lost that in our society, haven't we? Our society's very much become about pointing the finger. And it's not just the society. Again, oftentimes it's the church. And that's why a lot of people go, church is just a bunch of hypocrites because they're always just pointing their finger at me. 
Tell me all the wrong that I'm doing. And so it is a part of our role. But we've got to do it with caution. We've got to do it with gentleness. Now, I think today's message is so important. And again, I'm, I'm learning this myself, and hopefully you're going to be learning it as well. I just want to real quickly recap this message, just give you four little phrases that hopefully you'll just remember over and over and over again anytime you go to have a tough conversation with someone. The first thing is this, that silence is not a solution. And so when Jesus said, do not judge, he wasn't saying, do not address the situation at all. He's saying you do need to address it, but just do it with kindness and mercy and compassion, not condemnation. Number two, judgment has a boomerang effect. Remember, Jesus says, look, whatever judgment you throw out, that same type of judgment is coming back to you. So you better be judging people in the way that you want me, Jesus, to judge you. So if you want mercy and compassion and grace and forgiveness, that better be the thing that you're using as you go out and you judge other people as well. And remember, silence is not a solution. Go back to point number one. Silence is not a solution. You are called to do this. You just got to do it in the right way. And what is the right way? Well, point three, the first step in correcting someone else is to see and remove our own sin first. All of us have that huge plank in our eye. All of us have sin in our lives. And so every single time we're going to confront somebody or we're tempted to criticize, first of all, remember the stuff that's in your own life and then remember the grace and the mercy that was extended to you. And what is that? Number four, effective correction is done with kindness, gentleness, and humility. Imagine if we all started to do this. How different would your workplace look? How different would your family look? How different would your relationship with your friends look? If we all started to practice this. Uh, again, when it comes to great relationships, we are so quick to become critical of other people. But what if you started to, to practice this with your spouse? Instead of just being quick to criticize, what if you changed your attitude? What if instead of just responding to everything that they do and, or, and, and reacting to everything, you took a, a measured moment? Go, I'm not perfect. I got a plank in my own eye. And I want to help my spouse, but I'm going to do it with gentleness. I'm going to do it with caution. I'm not just going to sweep it under the rug. Silence is not a solution. I'm going to talk to my spouse in a, a loving way. Not a critical, condemning way. How about your coworkers? We're so quick to, to criticize. What if you changed your attitude? You started to treat them differently by the way that you speak to them. Or how about your kids? I mean, I know in your heart what you want is you want to help your kids. You want what's absolutely best for your kids. But what if the way that you're speaking to them is actually hindering them instead of helping them? Again, you may be speaking the truth, but if you're not speaking the truth in love, then it's doing more harm than it is good. So next time you're in that situation where you feel tempted to be critical of somebody, take a deep breath. Remember these four steps. Silence is not a solution. That in the same way I'm about to speak to this person and judge this person, that's the measure It's going to be measured back to me. And I've got to remember my own sin, and I've got to go in with kindness and gentleness and humility. Again, I believe that if we would all start to do this, it would transform our relationships in ways we couldn't even possibly imagine. That all of our relationships would start to become great 
relationships. Because now we're not doing things the way we want to do it. Now we're doing it the way that Jesus modeled. He didn't say, do not judge, period. He said, do not judge, comma. And then he gave us this teaching on how we can best interact with one another. So let's take these words of Jesus, the master teacher, to heart, put it into practice, and transform our relationships. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and this opportunity we've had to come together to once again look at your word and hopefully not just be inspired that we can be different, but to actually apply it to our lives, to, to take these things and the next time we get into a, a difficult situation or, or we see something we know that we should point out, to just take that moment and allow your spirit to remind us, to remind us that things can be different that I can give an evaluation, I can analyze somebody else's life, but I can do it in a way that's God-honoring and in a way that they'll actually thank me for coming in and giving them a little bit of constructive criticism. And that because of the, the heart and the attitude that, that we do it with, they won't see it as being judgmental. They'll see it as being helpful. Lord, right now, I know your spirit throughout this message has been bringing a face or a name to mind throughout. Somebody that, you know what, every single time I speak to them, it's a little harsh, it's a little critical, it's a little judgmental. Lord, help us just to start even with that person. Just be super conscious. To have your spirit Always remind us as soon as we're about to open our mouths, uh, 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 what you're about to say is, is that really what you want to say? And so help our words be seasoned with grace. Help us to speak the truth, but to do it in love in all situations as we're reminded that Jesus, you forgave us so much. You took that plank out of our eye. And so help us in light of that, to carefully, cautiously, gently remove that speck of sawdust from our brother's and sister's eyes as well. Jesus, we can do it. We, and we know that we can do it because you said that we can do it. That we can see clearly to do it. But it can't be about our flesh. We've got to constantly be dependent on your spirit. And so help us just to slow down a little bit and be in tune with your spirit at all times and in all ways. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.